I think we all are. Uh, okay. Yeah. You probably can use this only for the pointing purpose, not uh, navigating the slides. Yeah. So okay. Do that. Well, is everybody back? We ready to go? Uh, we're going to take a little different perspective on DNA sequencing. You've, you've heard all of the background, you've heard about the alignments, you've heard about downstream analyses, annotations. My perspective today is I want to give you a hands-on tutorial for how to navigate some of the software that's out there and also to show you how to navigate your homework. Okay, so yeah, that, it's back and it's real this time. Uh, so remember that the way to navigate the purpose of DNA sequencing is to go from the biological sample to a variant. So you can identify what Dr. Wu just taught you about today, okay? So here's the outline we're gonna to follow to get through this talk. We're gonna take a step back and talk about what DNA sequencing is a little bit for whole exome and whole genome, some of the differences, some of the benefits, some of the detractors. Then we're gonna go into a little bit about bioinformatic pipelines there are benefits and there are also detractors for using open source software and proprietary software. We're going to look at WGS pipelines, the whole genome sequencing pipelines that are available and in use here at the School of Medicine. I realize we have a very diverse audience. Some are high functioning informatics bioinformaticians. And I also realize there are folks in the room that um, maybe brand new to using a Linux system in an environment. So we're going to show you some examples today, some of the codes, some of the commands to ease the pain of your introduction into this. And for those of you that are in bioinformatics, you may have seen some of this. Uh, I also encourage you to share some of your knowledge <clears throat> so we can improve the conversation as we go. I'd like to reintroduce some of the Linux environments that are available to you to work in because it's important to remember what type of environment is available for you and the computational power of each. And then for the last part of it, I really want to take you through some of the software that you're going to see within the pipelines. Look at some of the pages, look at some of the, the packages that are available on the systems, and give you some tips about the best ways to use some of the software. Uh, there's a big piece in the middle here, GATK, that it's used in many ways, and it's a suite of tools that can make your life easier or difficult. So it's, it's a brilliant package of tools, but it's challenging to use sometimes, okay? And then what we'll do is we'll go down to the bottom and we'll look at the homework. And while this is happening, I'm not going to stay just on the PowerPoint. We're going to take a three-pronged approach to this. We're going to go from the PowerPoint. We're going to go to uh, a browser window and pull up the software and talk about some of the things that go along with the software because each of these packages is different and has different dependencies. You may find some challenges in running some of the software if you don't read the documentation and pay attention to what it needs to run. It will just tell you error messages and, and things have stopped and stalled. So you kind of have to figure out what's happening. And also, if you have any questions as we go, just, just please make this interactive. It's much better to get a question out while we're in a window. So please feel free to jump in. They can also schedule the individual meetings if they need help. Absolutely. And that's that's where I was, thank you for saying that, because where I was going to go with this is when we get into the window, I'd like to remind you that as a co-instructor of this course, I'm here to help you successfully navigate this course. Okay? You'll face challenges and you're going to have to do this on your own. But feel free to email me or call me, schedule an appointment, come sit together in my office. We'll open a browser window, we'll, we'll open a Linux window, and we'll work our way through some of the problems. Okay, don't be afraid to come by and ask questions. You're more than welcome. And remember, my office hours, we'll go through the last slide of that. They haven't been very busy, but I have a feeling it's about to change. <laughs> So as far as the DNA workflow, remember the first rule that I told you when I talked to you a month ago, your best friend is Google, okay? You're gonna run into some software that you haven't heard before. And also I'd like to make this very clear. The software I'm gonna show you 
is not the only option that you can walk down to go from a fast queue to a VCF. There are other tools available, and there are also tools that are coming out constantly throughout the year. I'm just gonna show you what's widely accepted and what we're currently using here. If you have other tools that you're using, um, please bring them into discussion because it will expand our knowledge base and that's always a good thing. The whole point of DNA sequencing is to determine the order of the nucleotides, but also to identify and annotate variants and changes to the genome. The reason for that you've already had explained to you, if it is in a non-synonymous region of, of the genome and it can affect protein coding or protein function, it can affect the outcome for that SNP. It can actually affect how the cell works, how the cell operates, proliferation rates, everything. So it's critical for us to get a clear understanding of the sample that we're working in of the changes that are happening in the genome. The FASTQ file you guys have heard about, it's a text file that's generated coming off of a sequencer. Lots of A's, G's, and T's, and the whole purpose of that is to give us a view of what three billion base pairs look like. What we have to do is make sense of it. We have to trim it. We have to reassemble it. We have to make sense of it as we go. Okay. You all have a pretty good feel now after Dr. Liu as to what a FASTQ file is. Okay. And if you remember, the outcome of this is eventually an annotated VCF file. So we want to go from that first sequencing file coming off of the sequencer all the way down through a VCF. At the end of it, as you, as you heard today, whether they're rare variants, whether they're cataloged in DBSNP or Cosmic or ClinVar at the annotations, the whole point is to get a systems biology understanding of the effect of that SNP on the phenotype of interest. It's very critical that we get through that. So I put a word on here that I don't, I don't like. It's more of an RNA sequencing word. But for whole genome and whole exome sequencing, same concept executed in a very different fashion. Okay, I, I put the word shotgun. That's more of RNA sequencing. I, I should have been entire. Okay, uh, I went back and forth on that. A lot of people love the word shotgun, but associate that more with RNA sequencing. But really what it is, is a nucleotide by nucleotide understanding and an ordering of all of the nucleotides within a genome. It's really a wonderful research tool because it gives us an idea of what is happening within the phenotype of interest for that genome for the entire sequence. There are differences between whole exome and whole genome sequencing. Whole exome focuses purely on the coding regions of the genome. And if you remember back, there are two or three different ways that we go about preparing this for it to happen. Right? So you can have array-based, you can have um, in-solution capture, you can have targeted enrichment before you go into the sequencing because you're really focusing on those exon coding regions of the genome. The benefits for whole genome sequencing, you get the entire genome, you understand everything that's happening at all locations, intergenic, exonic, UTRs, five and three primes, you get the entire thing, so you get a whole focus. But what comes along with that also are three billion base pairs that you have to understand what to do with. So that's a little bit more challenging because there are still parts of the genome that we're still trying to figure out. Is a pseudogene really a pseudogene and why does it look like a gene but it codes for nothing? What does it really do? But we get all this information, now we have to figure out how to use it. The benefits of doing whole exome sequencing it's faster. It's more specific. It's focused solely on the exome regions, the coding regions of the genome. How long do you think it takes to run a whole genome system from start to end? Any guesses? How, long, how, many, how many hours would you guys say it can take up to? What do you think? Mohammed, what do you think? Yes, you're really close. It can take anywhere from 72 to 96 hours of runtime if nothing goes wrong. Okay. When you do whole exome sequencing, it's much shorter. You can get that in about 48 hours if nothing goes wrong. Okay. So the outcome of the, of the information is vastly different. The files for whole genome sequencing are going to be much larger. Whole exome is much smaller. It's more specified. 
put the timing on it, which in a research setting for people that are trying to get out grants and papers and trying to forge into new areas of understanding the human genome and its functions, it's much more specific. So I'm not for or against either one. I think that your research question is always what drives what sequencing technique that you use. But just understand that what you get out of both of them is similar but different. Okay. Any questions so far? Are we okay? So you hear about this a lot, right? Bioinformatics pipelines. People develop pipelines for all kinds of sequencing technologies. There are benefits to it. One, it strings together software. So once you start a command and execute it, if your pipeline is written properly, you can go from your FASTQ to your VCF and it should be a wonderful outcome if it runs to completion. So my advice to you is once you start a pipeline, it's not to set it and forget it, the old method of, oh, it'll just run by itself. Please come back and continuously check it because you can get days into the analysis and it stops. Now there are multiple reasons why a pipeline could stop. Pipelines in general that are, are written at academic institutions link open source software. There are some inherent problems with open source software. Who maintains it? And let me, let me ask you this question specifically. For those of you that are interested in this field and you're developing tools and you're working on new ways to look at things, once you develop a software program and you're onto your next software program, how much time do you spend updating the dependencies and the references that have changed? Not always. So then you link it into a pipeline and you try and run it and it can't find the dependency it needs because the dependency is out of date. So who do you contact to get your pipeline running? Because what happens is most pipelines are generated by postdocs or doctoral students that move on to other institutions and you contact the PI and they say, yeah, that guy's gone. So there are challenges in developing pipelines. You have to be very diligent in taking care of your software to make sure that your analysis runs. Proprietary software also has benefits and challenges. Uh, one of them is that someone is always responsible for keeping everything up to date. They don't make money if their software doesn't run. The problem is they do it to make money and it costs a lot of money. So uh, have any of you ever heard of the Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, a pipeline to, to do pathway analysis? Do you all know what a license costs for that per year? It's about $13,000 a year. So if you're operating on grant funding money, $13,000 has to be accounted into your budget every single year, okay? So there's a benefit to having something that's constantly up to date, hand curated, and always, always functional. There's a cost that comes with it. Open source software is wonderful because once it's made a public domain, it's usable. Download it, link it into your pipeline, and go. You'll find some challenges in pipeline analysis. Two are time and coding skills, okay? There's an array of coding skills in this room, in this room, in our faculty. There's an array of coding skills. So if you're not an engineer, if you're not a computer scientist, if you're not a computer programmer, developing those skill sets takes time, okay? And if you have them, you tend to be extremely busy, so you don't exactly have a lot of time to build in Python. So it's kind of a relationship of the necessity over the demand. Right? Everyone needs a pipeline. And here's another question that I have for you. With all the labs that we have here doing whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, everyone putting pipelines into their own labs using mostly the same software, but somewhat different. Do you think that affects reproducibility and reliability when you run pipeline to pipeline to reproduce data? Believe it or not, it does. Because there are labs out there that only live and die by HG19, which is the long-standing human genome. And now HG38 is online, and some of the subtleties of it are different, and they're going to produce very different results. So there are wonderful properties to having the ability to take a fast queue, plug it into a pipeline, start it, and then let it run and come out with a VCF. But there are also subtleties that come along with maintaining it, caring for it, making sure it's reliable and reproducible, okay? 
It is not the kind of thing where you can just start a pipeline and walk away. What if you get into your pipeline and three days into it, it's stopped? That's a problem, right? Some of those you can start right after where it left off, but some of the time you have to go back and figure out why a bug happened or what went wrong software-wise, what output didn't become an input. And so be very careful if you're using pipelines. Make sure you really understand the software that's linked together because the dependencies are essential. So what does a pipeline look like? Well, not this, but this gives you a simplified view of what a pipeline looks like, okay? These are all open source softwares, and some of them you're gonna use for your homework. So this might be a point where you start kind of watching as to what's happening. So as you can see, the FastQ comes off the Illumina sequencer. The first thing that Dr. Liu talked to you about is maintaining the quality and the integrity of your data, right? He talked to you about FRED scores, so the base calling. He talked to you about mapping. He talked to you about consensus qualities. Making sure the first step that your FASTQ is of the highest quality starts the process off. A lot of people skip this step because, well, it takes time. If you can maintain the quality and, and understand that the data you're putting into your pipeline is good, you're way ahead of the game, okay? So you go into your fast queue and it gives you a fast queue report, which is basically an HTML file with a bunch of graphs on it that, that gives you your scores and, and the quality of your data. So it's very, very visualized, easy to read, and easy to understand, and you guys are gonna be generating those. Once the fast queue is known to be good, it's gonna move into what's called trim galore. Because if you'll remember, when we do sequence by synthesis, you have adapters that have been put on, they have to be taken off. They have to be ligated, they have to be removed. So we have to cut them out. From there, once we know that we now just have sequencing data, the three billion pairs or just the exome data, it has to be mapped on a line. You have to know where all of those fragmented pieces go. The card tools comes after your aligning. But there's one more piece of software that some people choose to use and some people don't. It's called SAM tools. You'll see that in a little bit. SAM tools, at this point, all the way through FastQ to Trimgalore, BWA, you can still be working with a FastQ file. The output of your BWA is going to be an aligned SAM, sequence aligned map file. It's different than a FastQ, okay? So the, the, the benefit of using something like SAM tools, it converts a SAM to a BAM, which is the smaller binary form that Dr. Liu talked to you about. The key to that is using the smaller BAM file will improve quality of all the rest of the steps through Picard, okay? Picard tools is wonderful because it takes your BAM file and then it marks, indexes, and sorts your BAM. So what that means is when you were making your libraries, when you were doing your amplification steps, when you were doing your sequencing, any artifact that is left, any reads that aren't an appropriate size are removed. It leaves you with a file where there are no more marked duplicates from PCR or other methods or from the sequencer itself. So the quality of your data, the integrity of your data, and hopefully the annotation at the end will be much more reliable and much more clear. For example, if you only have whole exome data and you've mapped all your data, but you have extraneous reads, what do you do with those? The card takes care of that for you. It removes it and, and makes it so your data is much more reliable. It has to be done before it goes into GATK or GATK will throw fits. It's a really, really intelligent, massive suite of tools, but it likes specific things and it really likes a sorted index mark duplicates file. When it BAM goes into there, it will go through all the steps to ensure your quality, ensure your base calls, and then start to generate your VCF. That is where your VCF file comes from, your GATK. The haplotype caller, some people use this, some people don't. It's, a, it's questionable. You've heard a lot about haplotype and it's been a lot, uh, part, a large part of uh, NGS for years. Haplotype calling and base calling, it's a very important step and actually making sure that your, your genome is correct. Variant annotation is one of the final steps, and that's what you saw today. 
you saw a lot of information in Anovar as a program, it's one program. So very widely accepted standard, it's a very good program. And we're gonna look at each of these programs. I'm moving you a little bit quick through this, but the point of it is, this is in a pipeline that we use here. And we've added a few more things, like at the bottom, for example, some of you are working in cancer and you're very interested in the differences between germline and somatic. Well, at the bottom of ours, after the variant annotation report, part of the GATK suite called MUTEC2 has been added so we can now take those variants and call them whether they're somatic or germline, and then it gives you the greater effect that you can look at your disease of, of choice. Any questions so far? Are we okay? Here's a more realistic view uh, of what pipeline looks at. It's a bigger exploded view of what goes on within the pipeline. This tells you, I'm not going to walk you through this because I've already put up the PDF for you and I want you to see for yourselves exactly how this works. It's a bit of a dance within the software of how files get moved and how they get annotated and how they're read and how they're worked with. But you can see this is more of an exploded view of each step of what you just saw in the last pipeline. Okay, It's the same pipeline but it's actually a workflow now, okay? Yes? No, so that's a great question. It can start with the FASTQ or BAM. Some people have BAMs, but the BAM started with the FASTQ. So in essence, yes, but in actuality, from an application standpoint, you can start with the raw, with the raw FASTQ and then put it through your, your processing for quality, or you can take a BAM file and you can begin at a lower step. It will recognize it and know where to start it. Or you, you will tell it where to insert the BAM file. So it's a wonderful question. In, from a technical perspective, they all start with the FASTQ, but you can start your pipeline with a FASTQ or a BAM file. Okay? And also, um, that, that indexing step at Picard, your BAM file is indexed, sorted, and marked, but it also generates another file. It's a BAI file. and there's been a misconception out there that a BAI file is a BAM, is not. Your BAM file is your index, marked, sorted BAM file. A BAI is basically consider it, in general, a table of contents, okay? It's a different type of file that goes with that BAM file to show that you now have a BAM file that is indexed. It always generates to the, the BAM file that's indexed and then the BAI file so you can confirm, yep, we did this. That help, but it can be banned more fast too. So let's talk about the other part of this. Uh, it's the coding part. Before I move on, are there any questions about pipelines, software, DNA seq, whole genome, whole exome? Everybody feeling okay? Because you've got a midterm coming up next week, and I want to make sure that you're in a good place. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, so in essence, once you've done your adapter trimming, you, you've given it the size of the reads that you're looking for, okay? And there are some points where you do get artifact that comes up, you will get uh, trimming errors, they're rare, because you tell it exactly what it's gonna cut, and you'll, you'll see this in a minute when we look at trim galore. There's a, a, a standard Illumin adapters that you plug into your code and it tells it exactly what to cut and what remove. But you can have, for example, if you'll remember when we talked about Illumina being short reads, those short reads went anywhere from, Dr. Lou, was it 35 base pairs to 150? Was that correct? Right in that window? So you have a wide array of what your short reads could be defined as. And so the whole step of this is quality control. It's to make sure that ambiguity is removed, artifact is removed, and that precision is much more available for the, the BAM files we can provide. Does the customer wide? Well, if you are talking about 
Call that. So you, you, you tell it. Uh, some of the platforms do have that option. So, like a control company, you cannot really control all the variations. So, sometimes you can arrange from 8 to 20 of the variations. But for the rooms, they always are a set of numbers. You can try to spread them in 30,000 cycles, you'll get 30,000. If you try to machine to run, um, and uh, in some of the situations for this adapter tuning is uh, when you do the system to run, and um, your the first thing to do is you, you cannot set a DNA sequence to like a, a 100 million music value to run the, at the end. The first step is you are doing the sequence to run, you break the DNA into smaller Usually, we can say that you are to about 300 days. Each of the genome sequences, maybe a little bit longer, depends on the work of what you want. But this is uh, uh, something that maybe the technical or physical control, meaning you can have third type of control, which is the bio curve dash two type curve curve. So some of them are going to be much shorter, like uh, maybe 120 days. And then when you sequence 106 days, there will be some part of the way. Only the first 100 cycles are the DNA you want to sequence, and then this is two times after. So you need to string those off because those are what the adaptive genes are. And also, over the last, <clears throat> oh, it, yes, I'm sorry. Sure. Sure, that's absolutely reasonable. And also, mapping quality itself has changed over the last seven or eight years. You say eight years ago, if it was seventy percent, people were happy. Now, now if we can get ninety, ninety-two percent, that's wonderful. That's a that's a wonderful moment in time, um, because there there always is a percentage that will not map. So, we've come a long way in the past eight years, but we're not at one hundred percent. 
I don't know if we'll get to 100%. Technology is evolving and developing and our understanding of everything is growing, but we're still a good, that's a good run at 92%. I mean, 88, 92, that's not unheard of for mapping qualities. So there's always a little bit within the human genome or actually any genome, unless it's de novo, then we're learning as we go, but there's always gonna be a bit of unmappability. So does everyone have access to the computing center? Did you all get DC2 Scratch? I know many of you already have it. I hope you did. Because it's, it's, it's gonna make it a little bit more challenging if you can't access the server. It'll, it'll, it will help. So if you have not done it, please do so. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but the last time I was here, the Friday before Labor Day, I mentioned that, that going to uh, access.iu.edu will get you space onto DC2 Scratch. Uh, the ironic thing is that I'm here on the Friday before holiday on Monday, telling you again to make sure you go to access.iu.edu. They may or may not be here Monday. So please uh, proceed accordingly with getting yourself access to the services as, as rapidly as you can. I know many of you already do from the informatics end, but for those of you who do not have it, uh, please make arrangements as soon as possible. The reason for that is you have a midterm coming up next Friday and your homework will be due in two weeks. So please move forward with this. If you do need help, if it's not working, do not hesitate, please come see me and we will go through the process to get you what you need to be able to do your work and access the Linux environment. So as you remember here, when I talked to you a month ago, there are multiple computing environments here that use Linux. Uh, Karst is one of the two. It's, it's a powerful high-performance compute cluster. And when you access the servers here at IU, the first thing you're going to get is an account and space on DC2 Scratch. Okay, that is important because that is where the file that contains your homework is at in DC2 Scratch. So make sure that your access is done as soon as possible. Okay, this will take time. If you remember, I pointed out to you the run times for whole exome and whole genome sequencing. That's to generate the entire thing through a VCF. You're gonna to wanna to give yourself time to learn the software and get through the alignment systems at EWA. So please make sure that you're available, that you have access to everything. When you're in a Linux environment, let me switch over here real quick. Uh, let's see. Make this a little bigger. Okay, so uh, for example, if you, this is, is this Karst? Uh, no, okay. So let us. Oh, this is yours. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So, uh, sorry. Okay. So. So I'm used to Karst desktop. I have that on my desktop. I haven't used this computer before. So. All right, because I don't really know yours. No, I work with this. Should be this guy. What what is uh, your? SQL. C A. It's the same thing. S E A C A U R T. C O U R. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. So here, uh, when you're in cars, whether you're in DC two, what see whether we can make the phone so we can say bigger. Phone. This code will help you to 
command line kind of module. This gives you every single program that's available in Karst. You'll find this very, very handy because some of the programs that you're going to work with are loaded, some of them are not. So all you're going to have to do, for example, if I were to work in FastQ, C, typing is always an issue with me. Module load FastQC gives it to me when I failed. Come on, let's go up here and look at it. Do you want the, the name? Oh, I, this is perfect. This is absolutely ideal. Do you remember that I was telling you about dependencies? Do you see a line? It won't run. It won't work. It won't load. It doesn't know how to do it yet because Java's not loaded. Perfect. Java's loaded. Boom. There you go. Now, something you have to know about FastQC is Java is not the only dependency. So it's what's called a wrapper script for a program called CutAdapt, which is a trimming package, and Trimgabor. So it's, it's, it's a very highly efficient, very fast trimming system because it has dependencies on two different programs. So it works very, very quickly. Now, if you're trying to run FastQC, but you're not quite sure what to type, here's something else you might run into. And I want you to know some of the pitfalls There's no manual loaded for FastQC. Okay. You're going to find this with a couple of programs. You may run into the same thing with Trimgalore. So if you go to let's see, let's do you know, how'd you how'd you maximize this? How can I get back to my other window? I want to minimize this now. Remember, I'm the window hop. Now they need to see some other things. So I, this is maximized, and how do I get it smaller? Uh, I want to go back to a browser. So if, if you want, you can hop out of this. It'll be, it'll be just totally fine. I can show them other things. Okay. Perfect, thank you. So you can't get any help when you're in the Linux environment. That's a problem. So what you can do is So it's by Brahman Bioinformatics, and some of the information that they're going to give you is listed on their page. Okay, in Linux you can load it if you've loaded three things: Java, CutAdapt, and Trimgalore. Okay, it needs those three things, and it will tell you when you try and run this that it's missing CutAdapt. It'll tell you that it's missing Trimgalore. But on their home page, it'll also tell you the adapter sequence that they use, which is an Illumina default sequence. And so you can see right here, the quality control for high throughput sequence, it's dependent, this language is Java. Mm -hmm. 
This, by the way, is one of the reports that you will get back. You'll get about three HTML reports, okay? So you'd be expecting those when you go to see those. And you'll see this, copy the best you see documentation. Now this could help us, right? It gives you a little more information if you dig through the home page. Okay. Now, some of the commands that are available to run this, because we're, we're running a little bit short on time. What I want to do is show you back here. So if it were me, okay. if I were going to run FastQC, you're not going to find this code anywhere. It's going to be very challenging to find. You're going to have to Google and dig, and it's a little frustrating. Okay. So what you may want to consider, let's, let's say you were working in Karst. Okay. I would consider a command that Karst seems to like. Yes, I did that. You have a close that. What I'll do is I'll do it in PowerPoint now. Yeah, I tried that. It didn't like it. Thank you. So let us go to here. This is a nice spot to give you something to think about. So if I were, again, if I were in Karst, So you're telling it you're going to submit a job. Okay, fast QC is your program. So the next thing it needs to know is that it's going to receive a file. Okay, but the next logical step is not only the fact that it's going to get a file, it's the type of file. So you have to come back and tell it fast Q one more time. And then if it were me, I would put my my files of interest after that. The reason I share this with you is that we have a wide array of people in this room that may or may not know where to find this information or exactly the subtleties of this command, okay? It's very critical, FastQC wants it in a certain way. Karst wants to know that you're submitting a job. So the Q sub tells Karst a job is coming your way. FastQC calls up the program after You've module loaded Java, cut it out, and trim the Okay, This command will help get you started. And I'm doing this on purpose. I realize that it's the first part of your homework, but the reason that I'm doing it is because I want you to start off with high confidence. How many of you in the room have ever run BWA? Have you all run it? No? So exactly. If we start off knowing we can generate reports, it's a big help. Then you'll know that the quality of your fast queues are high. The two that you are given, what are we at? Almost 50? The two that you will be given will be, let's get to here. I've given you guys the PDF on this and I want you to read them. But let's get to 
the important part that you're going to want to know about. Once you've gotten your access into Karst or into DC2 Scratch, there's a file that's under my name. The address is right there, slash n, slash dc2, slash scratch, slash ccourt, slash homework, slash dnac. Inside of there, you're going to find two FASTQ files that are from the Thousand Genomes Project. Okay? There's two reasons that I gave you that. One, they're widely published, and the data is good and reliable. It's high-quality data, so you should be able to generate all of this with no problem. Two, you've heard a lot about the Thousand Genomes Project. It's time to let you start looking at actual data. I could have given you in a setup established, I know this is going to work, this is going to be easy, but I would be robbing you of your graduate school experience. And I want you to actually deal with real software that's being used in real pipelines here at the School of Medicine and around the country, around the world, actually. What I'm going to task you with Okay, is I want you to do the FASTQC quality check on both FASTQ files, and I want you to share the homework through Box. Have you ever heard of Box? Do you all have Box accounts? If not, please set one up, please generate one. And what you'll have to do is send me a request to be, is it edited? I think it's called. Give me access to the Box. There's, there's two or three things. Um, I'm going to want to see the files that you've generated. And I'm also going to want to have, be able to help you along your journey because questions are going to come up. You'll be doing three things with these FASTQ files. You'll be checking them for quality through FASTQC. You'll be adapter trimming using Trim Galore. Now remember, you'll learn a little something about FASTQC because it has a wrapper script with Trim Galore. They're tied together. This is not the only way to generate the quality for these files. You can also use this in combination with TrimGalore. Many people do that. But I want you to go through all three gyrations. I want you to go through the FASTQ and generate the HTML files so we can see the quality. Then I want you to move into TrimGalore. I want you to take that, that FASTQ file, both of them that have been checked for quality, through TrimGalore, and I want you to use their Illumina adapter trimming to go ahead and get the files ready for alignment. And then within the file, I've put the genome for HG19. So it'll be a reference FASTA file that you'll be able to do alignments against using BWA. There'll be a little more information that comes along with that. Please do not hesitate to ask questions, okay? Whether it's an email, whether it's coming by my office, whether it's whatever you need to get through this process, I want you to succeed at this. It's not easy and it's not straightforward. Aligning, as you have seen through Dr. Lou's lectures, it's tricky. Okay. So if you guys haven't run the, the Burroughs Wheeler Aligner before, you're going to have to read some documentation. You're going to have to think about how to set this up to successfully navigate the commands. I'm not taking you all the way down through the VCF file for the simple fact that it's 96 hours of computation. Okay, it puts a heavy burden with 25 students on the system generating data all the way down to a VCF. If anything goes wrong, you may or may not be at a point where you're comfortable addressing it and fixing it. And it also puts a queue of 25 more people in line to use the server. I want you to do three things that the first part's gonna be quick. Trimming won't be as slow as BWA, but BWA is gonna be the longest, hardest part, okay? Any questions about what I'm expecting you to do for your homework? Any, any, expect, any questions about how the homework will come to me through Box? Come see me if you don't know how to set up Box, or come see me if this software is giving you problems. I promise you at my desk where I practice this, all of this work on a computer, I'm not sure about it, didn't go so well, and I apologize to you. But the thing is, is, is this, there are guides along the way. Every software has a forum, it has a page, and part of what was so important in showing you, it is gone. 
Um, so it's, it was called the GATK Best Practices Guide. Have you ever heard of this document? GATK is a tool of suites that takes the BAM and generates the VCF file. My recommendation from you, if you're going to do any next generation sequencing data, please go to the GATK website. The first tab on their website says best practices. So if you just type in GATK, it's from the Broad Institute up in Massachusetts. Their first tab will give you the best practices document. It lays out all of the parameters that you need to successfully navigate going through DNA seq programming, going through the pipelines. It shows you how to set things up and it gives you hints and tips. And if you get stuck with Trim Galore, if you get stuck with BWA, there are forums, there are boards, there are professors that will happily answer your questions, okay? Do not be afraid to go onto a forum and ask a question. I'm using BWA and this is the message I got and I'm stuck, what do I do? Uh, I will warn you, I have seen some sarcasm come back to people asking questions, uh, take them for what they're worth, but look for the value in the answers that come back from the GATK forums or the other seek answers and different things where you'll have sequencing um, responses, okay? And never hesitate to send me an email. I'm setting you up to do this. I'm happy to help you and navigate you through it. So um, any questions about the homework? Remember to access it, it's in VC2 Scratch. It's in my folder, C Court, which has been made public. So you should all be able to access it. If you can't, let me know. Yes, please. Okay, I'll address that when I get back. Um, So here's the other trick. FastQC is already on there. Cutadept is on there. Trimgore is not. So if you, when you, when I change the permissions, because it might be in, in NGS, it might be, you need to go to MMGL, uh, you will see Trimgore in there. Now, I want to remind you of a couple things. Every 60 days in VC2 Scratch, they, they dump everything. So if, if you're considering keeping the software, you may want to consider putting it in, a, in another location. And that's why we've chosen DC2 Scratch because you're going to do all this work and then it will free up the space again after 60 days, after you guys are done with it. FastQC is available within the modules. Trim Galore is not. I've downloaded it for you, but you can use the wget app, the line command, and then just put in the, the um, URL address and that will help you download the program. And then all you do is unzip it and you have the whole program to run. Uh, there's there's trim uh, there's trim war, uh, 0 0.4.3 and then they just released a new one 0 0.4.4 so i recommend 4.3 because it's a newer version of trim galore but do whatever you're comfortable with it's okay as long as you're generating the files that we need uh, you will not have to get the burroughs wheeler aligner that is already loaded into modules so all you have to do is call up java call up bwa and then you can start your commands to run what you need to run Okay. okay, that's easy. I, I can just put that in that file as well. Um, on mine, it yeah. shows up, but yours it does not. Yeah, yeah. right. No, but when, but when I pull up modules on my computer and it might be a permissions issue, I will just go back and put FastQC within the, uh, and, it, and it might be also be a Brahmin bioinformatics issue because they're both made by the same company. So maybe we don't have license to, to put it in modules. I'm not sure but it's a free download. I will also put that in that file for you. Thank you for telling me that because if you guys can't access the software, I'll take care of it. Yes, and I'll tell you why. Um, UITS is going through an issue right now where 0.3.7 just became 0.3.8 and they're in beta right now for 4.0. So they, they're 3.7 is kind of established norm for several years now. 3.8 was a newer release. But with 4.0 coming out in beta, I, my recommendation just from past experience is to move with trepidation before you move into 4.0. I would give it just a few months to make sure that the bugs have been worked out and that some of the concerns that are coming up and the inconsistencies that are gonna happen with GATK for right now are worked out because they're in beta right now. And if you, if you go to the GATK website, 
you can download 3.8, but 4.0 is in beta. You can, you can contact them for testing privileges, but right now I would let them work out the bugs on 4.0 before I tried to move into it. You may, want to, you may want to download it and play with it and see what you get, but my trust of the data would still be with 3.7 at this moment because of the consistency over the years. Okay, I will make sure FastQC is loaded there for you. I didn't put it there because I can see it in my modules. I thought you guys would too. Uh, don't feel free to contact, uh, feel free to contact me about <laughs> anything. Yeah, don't contact me, no. Uh, seriously, anything that comes up, any, any, any loading a program issue, any command line issue, do not hesitate. I want, I want you to work your way through it. I want you to do your best, okay? But I'm here to make sure that you struggle a little, but not fail. Yes, ma'am. Well, here's what I would say. Um, I have a PC at my desk, and you, you saw my efficiency with a Mac. I would recommend that you work in the environment that you are most comfortable and confident for generating data. Some programs will tell you, in a Linux environment, you know, we have a preferred load for Mac. Um, literally, it's, it's where you are most comfortable and confident with your own software and your own computer. Um, this worked perfectly in my office all day. I did this like three times. So uh, I apologize to Dr. Lou for fumbling on his computer. But that is the key to this, is working in an environment that you're comfortable and you're confident and you know the commands and it will work. Any questions about anything? Yes, ma'am. I would copy them over because remember in 60 days, DC2 Scratch is gonna wipe out these files. And the reason I say that, it gives you the freedom to access your files at your, at your convenience, copy what's there and go to work, okay? I'm uh, setting the 20th, as you can see on the bottom, as the due date. And the reason for that is your, your midterm is next week. Feel free to work on this. Feel free to work on the midterm. My recommendation is whatever avenue gives you the greatest success for Dr. Lou's course, okay? But it will be due by the 20th. So perhaps see how far you can get prior to the exam without adding any extra stress on yourselves and then we'll go from there, okay? But I will be here as a resource to help you in any way that you need help, okay? But if your charge is too slow out on the 19th, it's not good. No, it will run too long. Right, you can make it your job, it will take a while to get the piece of that started. Yeah, I would recommend you start working on the My recommendation would, to you would be to follow up on that. FastQC, since I've shown you the command, is brief and rapid. Thank you, guys. Thank <laughs> you. 